Yes. I see that the density of the population has decreased, but this is perhaps inevitable. After two lectures in the morning, then colloquium, I realized that people are tired. Yes. And uh, so, uh, in my first two lectures, I was discussing dipolar bosons. Yes. Now I will turn to, to dipolar fermions. This is the outline of my talk. Yes. And uh, so, yes. Um, this is our dipolar Fermi gas. Two dipoles like that repel each other. Two dipoles like that attract each other. So what does the dipole-dipole interaction do in a Fermi gas? Yes. For example, uh, Misha Baranov, giving his last lecture on fermions, explained you how the P-wave pairing between identical fermions can lead to superfluid transition, yes? And uh, you see, I will also talk about P-wave superfluid pairing in a single component Fermi gas, then about novel Fermi liquid. And I simply remind you that the dipole moment of, of realistic polar molecules, uh, these are polar molecules of alkaline atoms, is ranging from 0.6 dBi to all almost 6 dBi. You should divide by 2.4, and you get atomic units. Electron charge multiplied the Bohr radius. Yes, and uh, as I already explained you what people have done, they observed these bloody ultra-cold chemical reactions between uh, polar molecules. And all the time, we were thinking how to avoid these reactions. Yes, and then, as I already told you, uh, induce intermolecular repulsion, for example, two-dimensional geometry with dipoles perpendicular to the plane, yes? And, and there are other inventions how one can suppress completely or at least partially these ultra-cold chemical reactions and get nice many body physics. But before I turn to this, I would like to raise another question. When we talk about dipolar fermions, very often we mean that these are single component fermions, yes? They interact with each other through the interaction, which has only odd orbital angular momentum, which means P wave, et cetera, interaction. And generally, this interaction is much, much smaller than the ordinary S wave interaction between neutral atoms, bosons. So then the question is, why a single component fermions are interesting? You know, if the interaction is so small, so what? Yes, what can we do? Do, do we just obtain an ideal Fermi gas, or there is something behind it? And since I raised this question, you realize that perhaps there is something behind it. And here, I would like to go back to the work of Reed and Green in 2000. Yes, if I create vortices, yes, then zero energy mode related to two vortices, these are my, my two vortices, is very important. The number of zero energy states exponentially grows with the number of vortices. This is the formula. This is number of vortices. And then what you get in the system is non-abelian statistics. Exchanging vortices creates a different state. We have a non-local character of the state, and local perturbation does not cause the coherence. Yes, this was actually the main idea of this work, and there were related works after that. This is interesting because of the topologically protected quantum information processing. Yes, so in two dimensions. When I, I talk about the topological protection, the topological protection and all this, this is two dimensions, yes? And <clears throat> with this idea in mind, what we can do, we can study identical fermions in two dimensions. We strongly confine the motion of particles in one direction. So statistically and kinematically, it's two dimensional, yes? And then, 
we start thinking what will happen, yes? And then uh, people were studying the P-wave interaction between particles for quite some time, and what they have found are the so-called P-wave resonances in many places, yes? When, you, when I'm out of resonance, the BCS, superfluid papyrus theory, which Misha Baranov explained to you, gives an extremely small, practically zero transition temperature, yes? But if we have a resonance, then this interaction is much stronger, yes? And we may hope that somewhere here we get something interesting. Because here, in the BCS regime, this is the interaction constant, the transition temperature is practically zero. But what it turns out is that in this regime, the system is collisionally unstable. And this has been measured experimentally, and theoreticians, of course, have worked on it. Unstable because there are creations of these pairs, which are almost molecules, and so on. And it's also unstable here, on this side, where this interaction is positive, because you get P-wave molecules, and those molecules are unstable. They decay due to relaxation to a deep bound state. So, of, so what we have here is hopeless, yes, in the sense that I change the magnetic field. I wish to get the strongly interacting regime, which I hope will help me to get something interesting, yes. But it turns out that in this regime, the system is unstable. Of course, this is not the whole story, and we did not yet deal with dipoles regarding this picture. So what people said uh, is that, let us consider RF, radio frequency, or microwave, the rest of polar molecules in two dimensions. And the idea of doing that, it comes from Innsbruck, yes? So, so let us imagine that we have the DC electric field and AC electric field, and then the microwave uh, arranges a transition from the rotational moment zero to rotational moment one, uh, yes, and then the dress states of molecules are linear combinations of zero, zero, and one, one, yes. Here I have sigma plus light, yes. And these coefficients uh, they contain the frequency of the transition and the coefficient A, which depends on the frequency and on the detuning from the resonance, yes? So if I consider such two radio frequency dressed molecules, yes, in 2D, then I may think of the dipole moment, which is rotating, yes, with the radio frequency, and yes, like this in the plane. So, then what I can do, I can write down the effective interaction potential. At large distances between the molecules, it's minus unity divided by R cube. At smaller distances, it acquires a potential well and the repulsive part. And here I would like to emphasize that this optically induced potential occurs at distances 100, 200, 300 angstrom, which are much larger than the distances of interatomic interaction. This is just the optically induced, optically induced potential, yes? So what you can do in order to obtain this form, you can, you can simply average the dipole-dipole interaction, or what you can do quantum mechanically, you may solve a matrix, yes, with all these matrix elements, and then you obtain the same result, yes? Where DC is sort of effective dipole moment, which is of the order of the dipole moment of the molecule. And R star is a characteristic dipolar distance. At distances larger than this R star, the motion of molecules with, with respect to each other is free. When the distance is of the order of this guy or smaller, it is influenced by this interaction potential. So please pay attention to the fact that this optically induced potential is attractive, yes? And then what, what we can say, and Misha Baranov in his last lecture was explaining you superfluid pairing between identical fermions. If, this, if there is an attraction, this is the 
a superfluid pairing due to P wave interaction, etc. Yes. Then assume that we have these molecules in a single quantum state in 2D. The attractive interaction for the P wave scattering uh, is important. This is my Hamiltonian, which contains the kinetic energy term and the interaction term. Yes. Then we introduce the order parameter for superfluid pairing delta, which Misha did in his lecture, like V effective, yes, multiplied psi psi average. Then what he has done, he also has written the so-called gap equation, yes, where the order parameter is related to uh, the interaction potential through this formula and elementary excitation. Yes, the elementary excitations are given by a simple formula, this one, which is very, very easy when, when I diagonalize this Hamiltonian using the Bogolubov approach, yes. And then the transition temperature is Fermi energy multiplied numerical coefficient exponent in the power minus 3 pi divided by 4k Fermi R star, yes. And delta uh, for P wave, Px plus Ipy state is it's a certain constant, angular independent, multiplied exponent in the power i phi. Pay attention on this quantity. Uh, what we usually do in the weakly interacting regime, we say that k r star is much smaller than 1. How much smaller? It's a different matter, but much smaller. And then you see that the quantity which is standing here is large. So the transition temperature is exponentially small compared to the Fermi energy. How large or how small, it's a different matter. But let us then compare to the case of atoms. For short range potentials for P wave scattering, the Fourier transform of V effective is K squared and Tc is exponent in the power of minus one divided by K Fermi atomic distance in the square. This is practically zero because it's a square, yes? But in the for the dipole-dipole interaction, for the unit divided by a cube potential, we have anomalous scattering, which I emphasized in, in my pre previous lectures. This is the scattering which comes from distances of the order of particle de Broglie wavelengths, yes? And uh, this contribution comes from these distances, and then uh, the effective interaction as a function of k is, propor is proportional to the first power of k, yes? And then we get this, uh, this, uh, this formula for the transition temperature where I have this effective interaction multiplied the density of states on the Fermi surface, which is m divided by h bar squared, and I get the formula which I have written in my previous slide, yes? So um, let us discuss a bit later how big or how small is this transition temperature. But now I would like to emphasize the following. What people can do, I think that Misha in his lectures emphasized this, people can do better than the simple BCS theory, yes? As he told me, he derived the so-called renormalized gap equation, yes, which is, this is the, the off-shell scattering amplitude, excitation energies, temperature. This is the single particle energy. Then I use this expression for the order parameter. I use this for the scattering amplitude. And then for the scattering amplitude, I take into account uh, also second order correction, which is k squared logarithm k, which, uh, which, which you can calculate explicitly, yes? Uh, this is for the on-shell, and there are related results for the off-shell scattering amplitude, yes? Then what I do, I substitute this f of k, k prime, and include this term, yes, right? And I get the transition temperature in this form, yes? But then, again, 
it is not sufficient in order to obtain a numerical coefficient in front of the exponent, one should take into account the so-called Gorkov-Milik-Barhudarov corrections. These are corrections due to the polarization of the medium by particles, yes? Particles collide, they rescatter, and then, and then scatter once more, and you get all these diagrams. This delta V is second order, yes? And then you obtain, really, that Tc is this exponential quantity, multiplied Fermi energy in the power 0.3, numerical coefficient kappa, and multiplied the characteristic molecular energy, which is much larger than the Fermi energy. That's what you do in this case. And this kappa can be varied within two orders of magnitude. Yes. This is the result for which you have to fight for a very long time, yes? And this is what we were doing, yes? And this was justified by the fact that, uh, yeah, if I consider, for example, lithium potassium molecules, where D is 3.5 dBi, at density 210 to 8 particles per square centimeter in 2D, then the Fermi energy is 120 nano K, and then this Tc, the transition temperature, is 10 nano K, right? So, uh, in present experiments, very many people in this world obtain temperatures 20, 30, 10 nano Kelvin, or even lower, yes? And th this is already the temperature at which you can do interesting physics. Certainly, uh, you know, if I compare with atomic superfluids, yes, there is a big preference here for the molecules, yes. We have sufficiently large transition temperature, but what we also have, and this is the most important, is collisional stability, because these molecules, they can collide, yes, and then one of them is dissociated, another one goes to a deep bound state, yes? And people have calculated the rate of this inelastic collision, so it's written here. A is a coefficient 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4. And it turns out that this, we call it rate constant of inelastic collisions is 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9 centimeters squared per second. So for this example, I get the decay time of a couple of seconds. And for experiments with cold atoms, it's a lot, yes? Because usually when people talk about Bose-Einstein condensation, ba -bum, ba -bum, usually a characteristic lifetime or the time of the experiment is about several seconds, up to 10, 15. And I think it was the record of Eric Cornell who obtained the Bose-Einstein condensate with the lifetime of let's say, one minute or so, because it decays anyway due to foreign particles and so on, yes? Usually, it's, usually we talk about seconds, yes? So that's what it is here, yes? Which is important, and therefore, I would say that um, this is a very interesting phenomenon and people are going to try it experimentally, but it's, it's not that easy, yes, as well as obtain superfluid pairing in three dimensions that Misha discussed with you, yes. And that's what it is now. And here <coughs> I just give you the list of papers, yes, which, which describe this phenomenon, yes. Now, this is a bit too early, right? So if you have questions regarding superfluid pairing of identical fermions, and which were discussed in the lecture of Misha Baranov, or which I discussed right now, please ask me these questions now, because after that, I'm going to switch to novel Fermi liquids of, of polar molecules. Yes. Do you have questions? I do not see raised hands, which means that either nothing is clear 
or, or everybody understood everything, yes? What is important is that there is attractive interaction between particles, and it is attractive in the P-wave channel, and that's what the case here, yes? And then, in this case, you obtain a certain superfluid transition temperature. And then for the dipoles, due to anomalous scattering, only due to anomalous scattering, you get a sufficiently high transition temperature. Two things are important, attractive interaction and the presence of anomalous scattering, yes? And then you are in, yes? This is the result. Okay, so, now, what I would like to do, I would like to get to another file. Yes. Right. So, I would like to now to return to the trivial idea, which I presented in my last lectures and also now. So, I would like now to consider a very simple case, or oh, sorry, when you have 2D layer, two-dimensional geometry, all dipoles oriented in one and the same directions. They're all fermions, yes, right? And then, if I sufficiently strongly confine them in this direction, then the ultra-cold chemistry should be suppressed or significantly suppressed. It is never suppressed completely, yes? And I get something which turns out to be Fermi liquid you understand that when you have dipoles like that, looking in one direction, they repel each other, yes? So there is no attractive interaction, and there is no superfluid pairing, yes? So in the case of fermions with repulsive interaction, what we get is the so-called Fermi liquid. Very interesting phenomenon. And by the way, the theory of Fermi liquid has been developed by Landau, yes? And in 1964, he got the Nobel Prize for the theory of quantum fluids, which was for both bosons and fermions, yes? And Fermi liquid theory was part of this Nobel Prize, yes? Unfortunately, in 1964, it was already after this horrible traffic accident, after which Landau became practically very sick and disabled. He died in 1968. Yes, so, but this Fermi liquid theory has been created in, in, in the 1940s and 1950s, so, which we may say a long time ago, but in order to understand what kind of Fermi liquid this is, yes, I will first solve the scattering problem, how uh, such dipoles interact with each other, what is the interaction amplitude, yes? And 2D scattering problem in the potential unit divided by RQ at large distances, yes? Um, so we divide the range of distances into two parts. Distance is smaller than a certain R0, a distance is larger than that. And the distance R0 is just selected such that it is much larger than the dipole-dipole distance, yes? And we are in the weakly interacting regime that momentum multiplied R star, and it's actually Fermi momentum is much smaller than one. At distances here, smaller than this R0, we match the exact solution at k equals zero. You know, the Schrodinger equation with finite momentum in the potential unit divided by R cube, you cannot solve it exactly, even in terms of mathematical functions. But for k equals zero, you can, yes? For unity divided by R4, it's different. You have a solution in, in terms of Mathieu functions. For unity divided by R cube, it's not. But for k equals zero, you have this solution, 
And, and you match this exact solution with free motion at a finite k at r equals to r zero. And you get something like that, where this psi is a numerical coefficient, yes? This is a constant, yes? The error constant. For r larger than r zero, you may consider interaction as perturbation, and then you get this guy, yes? So, excuse me, that's what it is, right? Then, You've now considered 2D scattering at orbital angular momenta larger than 1. Yes. There is only contribution at this of anomalous scattering at, from distances larger than unit divided by k. And then here, you get first and second born approximation, and this is the result. Yes. You know, um, only for the S-wave scattering, which was on the previous slide, it's important to take it, short range part, long range part, and so on. Uh, for L larger than one, the short range part is negligible. And you are dealing with only anomalous scattering. Oh, sorry. Yes. And this is the result. The end. To first, in, in the first order, including all odd partial waves, the off-shell amplitude is given by this relation of okay, KR, the momenta. yes? Now, once I have all this, yes, what I can do, I can go to the many-body theory. And what we usually do in the simplest case, we consider the mean field approach, yes, which is the simplest case. Here, we can even go beyond the mean field. There is an, an old question uh, of beyond mean field effects for weak interactions, yes? And then, it has been solved by Ri Huang Yang and by Abrikos of Kalatnikov for short-range weak repulsion in a two-component Fermi gas, where S-wave scattering is important. This is the formula, and then you have an expression for pressure. So this is the non-mean field correction, yes? And then there were experiments of Christoph Salomon at the Col Normal Superior with fermion, lithium fermions, where he was recovering for short-range interaction this non-mean field correction from the experiment, yes? And <clears throat> so, this is the case for short-range interacting particles. What is the case for these polar molecules, for the dipoles? And here, you know, uh, what I can do, I can do something which is transparent, yes? First of all, this is my Hamiltonian in the momentum space. These are annihilation and creation operators of particles with momentum k, kinetic energy, and this is the interaction between particles, yes? Uh, the fir to first order, the interaction energy is given by this relation. V is the Fourier transform of the interaction potential. These are the occupation numbers. To second order, I have a very well-known expression from quantum mechanics. This is a general expression which you can find in any book of quantum mechanics, yes? The amplitude, which is, which is here, scattering amplitude, is expressed through the Fourier transform of the interaction potential, yes? And then the interaction energy can be represented in the following form, where this is the first order, the interaction amplitude, yes? I simply use a relation between the scattering amplitude and the interaction potential. And this is the second order contribution, yes? Correct. Okay. Here F is the sum of all odd orbital angular momenta. Now I have all these nice relations, and in principle, but only in principle, I am ready to do the calculations. Yes? So, and many people would do this, but we will do it differently. Yes? We Recall that there is a Fermi liquid behavior, yes? And 
there are quasi particles, dressed particles with the, with the same Fermi momentum as the Fermi momentum of particles, but there is an effective mass. What people usually do, they introduce the so-called interaction function of quasi particles. Yes, so that variation of the quasi particle energy is expressed through this function, multiply the variation of the distribution function. And then variation of the energy is given by this relation, yes, this and this contribution, yes. This n over k is close to the Fermi step, and delta n, the variation, which is in here, is non-zero only near the Fermi surface. Yes, this is n, and delta n is non-zero only somewhere here. Right. So after these words, he, having in mind that there is this guy, interaction function of quasi-particles, I continue. And then I will discuss this interaction function, yes, and the interaction function of quasi-particles, this guy here, it, it enters the expression for the effective mass and so on. And there is a relation. Uh, for the variation of the chemical potential and the interaction function of quasi-particles. Yes, this is a variation of the distribution function, yes. And the inverse compressibility is just d mu dn, the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to the number of particles. And then uh, what I can do using these relations, I can express this d mu dn or compressibility through the interaction function of quasi-particles, and I obtain this formula, yes? Now, uh, what I can do, I can calculate this interaction function of quasi-particle, having in mind the expression for the energy. It's the second derivative with respect to distribution functions, yes? And then I, I f fairly transparently obtain this relation where this guy is like this plus some many body contributions, yes? You know, the thing is that the expression for the total energy, if I try to calculate it, is horribly complicated, yes? And if I wish to do the work analytically and obtain physics, I simply, I would, I would spend time until my retirement. In my case, it's useless to talk about the retirement because from CNRS, I'm already retired, yes. From CERN, not yet, right? But my student, Jean Kailou, who was doing these calculations, told me, Jora, I, I would do these calculations for the expression for the energy until I retire. And he's younger than me by 35 years. It's a very long time. But fortunately, we can calc oh, sorry. Uh, we can calculate the interaction function of quasi-particles. And then, knowing this, we calculate, using this formula, we calculate the chemical potential. And knowing the chemical potential, we calculate the energy, zero temperature, yes? So. That's what it is here, yes. And then, knowing this d mu dn, we calculate this compressibility. And then we, we know that the hydrodynamic sound velocity is given its, its, Fermi, its Fermi velocity plus correction. We obtain the expression for the effective mass and so on. And what we eventually do, in a way I explained to you, knowing the compressibility, which is proportional to the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to number of particles, we calculate the chemical potential. And if you know the chemical potential, you integrate once more and obtain the energy. Yes? And this way of calculating the energy of the system, also for short range in interaction, has been introduced by Abrikos of Kalatnikov long, long time ago. One, one or two years before them, Xian Yang, this is the famous Xian Yang, who is Nobel Prize winner in high energy, for high energy physics results. They obtained a very intelligent way of calculating the energy without 
knowing the issue of renormalizing the scattering amplitude and so on, their method is beautiful, but it's like this, yes. One, one should really be C and Yang in, in order to do calculations by using their method, yes. Abrikosov and Kalatnikov invented the method, which I am explaining you now, yes, how to calculate the <coughs> energy without calculating the energy. In the, Fermi, in the Fermi systems. What you should do, you should calculate the compressibility, since you know the expression for the interaction function, which is much easier than the expression for the energy. And then you obtain chemical potential and then the energy. Yes, that's what it is. Now, uh, I would say that usually uh, when people do these things, they distinguish between the hydrodynamic and collisionless regime, yes? So, you calculate the relaxation time of a non-equilibrium distribution which occurs in pair collisions, therefore its temperature in the square is given by this relation, yes? Since K Fermi is proportional to square root of density in 2D, tau is density independent, yes? Uh, for the dipole moment, 0 0.25 dBi, it's for potassium rubidium molecule in the electric fields, which do not fully polarize these molecules. At an infinite electric field, this will be 0 0.6, but at the fields of 20 kilovolt per centimeter used in these experiments, so this is 0 0.25, yes. And temperatures 10 nano Kelvin, yes, at these densities, Fermi energy like this, this tau is 30 milliseconds. And when this tau is much larger than unity divided by omega, where omega is the excitation frequency, you have the so-called collisionless regime. When this is the other way around, tau is small, yes, all these collisions, they they actually arrange particles to local density distribution and so on. And then what you have, you have the hydrodynamic regime. In the hydrodynamic regime, you have sound waves with, with velocity, which is very close to the Fermi velocity. So in the example that I'm giving you, only very low energy excitations with a frequency smaller than 5 hertz are in the hydrodynamic regime. For larger frequencies, yes, you get the collisionless regime, yes? And then, you know, in the collisionless regime, you do not have ordinary sound waves in Fermi systems. In the collisionless regime, you have the so-called zero sound. Usually, when you study sound waves, people are pronouncing the term uh, first sound, second sound, and so on. Here, I pronounce the term zero sound. What is zero sound? Zero sound is related to deformations of the Fermi surface, and you, and you may extract normal walls from there. This is my kinetic equation for the variation of the distribution function and the uh, quasi-particle energy, yes. And then this is delta function because N0 is just a step function distribution, yes. Then this is the expression for delta N through this omega and k, frequency and momentum of the sound wave. And then I get this relation for the coordinate derivative of the variation of the quasi-particle energy, which is transformed to this relation. And then you obtain a relation for the, uh, let's say, dispersion relation, yes? Right? Knowing the interaction function, yes? and what you do eventually, yes, and several people did it, yes, you get undamped zero sound when this quantity S, yes, is larger than one, or the velocity of zero sound is larger than the Fermi velocity, yes. So then what you get is that the velocity of zero sound is the Fermi velocity plus some correction. And, but there is a very peculiar thing in this, 
in this calculation, yes? And as I already explained you, here I have the interaction function of quasi particle, yes? This is my u0, this is my interaction function, yes? And then the interaction function contains everything, the mean field contribution and the non-mean field many body effects. What happens is that only, only these many body effects, many body corrections give, give the result, otherwise it doesn't work. So this is a very strange case where you obtain an undamped zero sound only due to many body effects. And this allowed us to say that we have novel Fermi liquid. Yes, that's what it was. Yes, and uh, okay. So the system looks very simple. Yes, what you have two-dimensional geometry, dipoles like that, they repel each other. Yes, they're all fermions, identical fermions. What can be easier than that? Nothing. The easiest case. And then it turns out that this easiest case is non-trivial regarding the zero sound velocity. Yes, only many body contributions, which you have to find out, provide the undamped zero sound. Yes. That's what it is. Uh, of course, what we can do, we can just do it in a, in a very solid way, yes, and then just write down system of equations and so on, obtain the zero sound velocity, yes, and then obtain the velocity. What this velocity is like that, yes? So it's, the situation is very different from a two-species 3D Fermi gas with contact repulsion, where already the mean field effect gives you the result. Yes? Right. OK. So I, I finished with this file. And before I continue, you may ask me questions, yes? Please do. Hmm? What I have shown you is that a trivial system, yes, which is, well, not trivial, but I would say simple system, yes. Just all dipoles like that in two dimensions turns out to be very non-trivial, yes? Now, now I have a little bit of time and I continue. You know, and why we consider this system for a very simple reason because we wish to suppress the ultra-cold chemistry, induce intermolecular repulsion. If I induce intermolecular repulsion, the system is repulsive, it's a Fermi liquid, and then I have to find out what is non-trivial in this Fermi liquid. And it turns out that what is non-trivial is the zero sound velocity, which without non-mean field, beyond mean field corrections does not exist in the undamped form. That's what it is. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, people were trying to get such a system experimentally, but hopefully in the, near in the near future this will happen. Usually what happens, that what I predict theoretically is measured in the experiments 7, 10, 15 years later. In 1994, Together with York and Mary Reynolds, we predicted Bose-Einstein condensation of spin polarized metastable triplet K, which without spin polarization very rapidly decays due to panning ionization. And the experiment showed that this is the case seven years later. 
Celebi. Uh, in 2003, we predicted the Roton Maxon spectrum for, for dipole bosons in two dimensions. Yes? And this has been measured only one and a half years ago. So something like 14 or 15 years later. And when we made this prediction, first people were saying that we are wrong and there, is, and there is a mistake somewhere and so on. Yes, you know, these theoreticians sometimes are very nasty. Yes, when someone does something and his statement contradicts to what is known, they start saying this is wrong. Why wrong? Just because it is wrong. Okay. Yes, uh, and uh, after this lyrical deviation, what I would like to do, I would like to do something which is also interesting. For example, if we consider one layer with dipoles like that, what we can do, we can also consider two-layered geometry. Yes. And here I put white. In both cases, dipoles are perpendicular to the layer. The outer cold chemistry is suppressed. Yes. These are identical fermions. This fermion, the internal state, is identical to this one. But why I put here yellow color and here white color? For a very simple reason. If you have a bilayer system, there is one more quantum number the layer, yes? So these fermions belong to this layer, these fermions to this layer. So they have, they have different quantum numbers, layer up and layer down. Therefore, what they can do, they can undergo S-wave scattering. For example, this guy interacts with this guy, and there is S-wave scattering, yes? Just because they are different because of the layer index, yes? And then what you can do, if these are dipoles, yes, uh, then what you can do, you may consider superfluid pairing between dipoles from here and dipoles from here. But first of all, you should understand what the system is. And then, uh, fairly surprisingly, it turns out that the dipole of this layer and dipole of this layer, they always form a bound state, even if the layers are very far from each other. The bound state always exists, yes? Put one layer here and the other one where? In Paris, yes? And there will be a bound state, but of course the binding energy will be so exponentially small that we don't care. And actually, when we started this problem, we didn't know about the work in mathematical physics, which has been done in 1971 or 74, where the person just did it theoretically very nicely and predicted this phenomenon, yes? But so, I now consider the interaction of these fermions from here with fermions from here, yes? This is the interaction potential as a function of in-plane distance between them, rho, yes? When two dipoles are on top of each other, they attract each other, yes? This is the potential world. When they are far from each other like that, they repel each other. There is a potential hump, and then it goes like this. Here, I have already written that there is a bound state of these dipoles and it always exists, yes? Uh, then, uh, right. So, for, I can obtain the binding energy, yes? Where here I a little bit mixed up the relation, this B should be lambda. I'm sorry for that, yes? But the expression for the binding energy is like that, yes? So then we know that these guys form a bound state, yes? Let me just explain physics. 
there are two limiting cases. The first one is the case where this binding energy is much smaller than the Fermi energy in the layer, yes? In this case, we don't care of this binding energy, yes? And we simply have the uh, S-wave BCS pairing between these dipoles and these dipoles. There will be interlayer Cooper pairs, and then you the, obtain the result, yes? So, but if the binding energy is much larger than the Fermi energy, then what you form, you form these bound pairs, and then dipoles here and dipoles here, they move together because they, they form a fairly deeply bound molecular state. So in the first case, you get fermions, and, and if the scattering amplitude is negative, and it will be negative here, you get S-wave fermionic BCS pairing. In this case, you get molecules, and molecule, fe one fermion plus another fermion is a boson, yes? So in these bosons, may bose condense. You get Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, yes? So that's what it is. Two different limiting cases, Yes, and they have been studied. And then, <clears throat> so we know, at least those of us who, uh, who were learning theoretical physics with attention, yes, that's what I was doing when I was an, an undergraduate student, that in two dimensions, we have the so-called Kosterlitz-Taulis transition. We simply cannot act in the same way as in three dimensions. But what people have done, in particular people studying these thin helium-3 films, they have concluded that in the weakly interacting regime for fermions, the Kosterlitz-Taulis transition temperature is close to the te transition temperature of the BCS approach. This is for the first case where we don't care of the binding energy between these parts. Yes, fermions, yes. Then, if K Fermi R star is much smaller than this guy, we have the contribution to the scattering amplitude, which is given by this relation, short-range contribution, and the costerless towerless transition temperature is given by this relation, yes. Uh, when this guy is much larger than anomalous scattering winds, we have F over K, given by this relation, yes, with this k, k squared term, and so on. And the uh, Kosterlitz-Taulis temperature is given by this relation, yes. Okay, don't pay attention to these complicated formulas. Knowing the scattering properties, what we can do, we can derive all of them, yes. So, this is for, for the case of fermions, yes. We obtain either this relation or this one, and this is much simpler, so that's what we do, yes? So when we have very large binding energy, we have these interlayer dimers, interlayer molecules, dipoles from here and from here, they move together, yes? It's a bound state, it's a molecule. And we have molecular Bose-Einstein condensation, and there are formulas for the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, Kosterlitz-Taulis temperature in 2D, yes, which we know, which are present in literature. And sorry, here, what I would say is that here, I simply present this result. Don't pay attention on this green curve. It's, it's a wrong curve. This is the correct curve, yes. And then it turns out that for lithium cesium or potassium rubidium molecules with the separation between layers 250 nanometers at this density, you get this K Fermi B like this, E Fermi 100 nanokelvin, and you get the costerless towerless temperature of a few nanokelvin, yes? So this is another interesting system where without collisional instability, you may get superfluid pairing between identical fermions. 
And this system, I would like to say now, uh, let me go back. OK. Ah, here, I just give a paper where this has been done. Here, I specially consider this bilayer geometry, yes, which is likely to be the geometry suitable for high temperature superconductivity with electrons, yes. Of course, in high TC studies, this is likely to be the D-wave pairing and the situation is different. But in a later stage, people have considered the case where here the dipoles are like this, and here they are like this. Yes, and here what happens is that there is P wave and D wave pairing, yes? And then in contrast to, to the case that I discussed with you, in this case, the D wave pairing and P wave pairing may win because S wave pairing is, rep is repulsive. So, but P wave pairing and D wave pairing, they lead to attractive interaction. And there can be P wave or D wave superfluids. Yes. And then, you know, I came up with this idea. Yes. And then some people started to jump into this field and they calculated the superfluid transition temperature due to D wave pairing. And they were happy when they finished and obtained the result. But the result was such that the transition temperature was 10 to minus 40, 10 to minus 30, 10 to minus 20 Kelvin. Yes? OK. And in a later stage, what other people have done, and one of these people was me and also some other people, they said that let us do something with the density of states. And they considered lattice, yes? Yes, lattice here and lattice here, which changes the density of states, yes? And one may obtain a significantly larger transition temperature, which is approaching nano Kelvin, yes? So that's what it is. So these bilayer geometries, they are not only useful for showing the, the, that in some cases you may get a collisionally stable system and obtain superfluid pairing for identical fermion. They, they can be useful and maybe will be useful for explaining certain phenomena in complex condensed matter systems. Yes, this is what I am saying now. Yes, OK. So uh, now I finish with this part. I think I did. And I am now ready to listen to your questions regarding all parts of my talk of today. Ask questions. Was the physics clear or not? The physics. The fact that formulas are sometimes complicated and unclear, it's, a, it's OK. That's what they should be. But what about physics? Is something still unclear? Hmm? I see that you probably have questions somewhere in the first rows. What is unclear? Tell me. And I will improve, hopefully. Yes? Uh-huh. No, 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 no. For hydrodynamic regime, it does. But for the uh, zero sound, uh, the, the mean field contribution drops from the final result, yes? The mean field contribution, of course, exists to the interaction function of quasi-particles, but it drops from the final result. And what you obtain is that you get undamped zero sound only if you take into account the many body corrections. Yeah, but uh, in order to, to formulate the, 
behavior in the microphone, you introduce uh, Delta, and this Delta ends with Colin. What's first? Uh, well, uh, you, you know, in the Fermi liquid theory, what you have, you have epsilon. For example, if it's a uniform system, you have quasi-particles. You, you know, the Fermi liquid theory initially has been introduced for liquid helium. It's a strongly non-ideal system, yes? And therefore, all particles are strongly interacting with other particles. So single particle here is dressed by other particles. And what Landau introduced is epsilon over k, the quasi-particle energy. And k is the momentum. The, uh, the Fermi momentum in the system is the same as it will be in just in an ideal Fermi gas. And then what is also present is the distribution function of quasi-particles, n over k. Yes? And this n over k, without any perturbation, it's a, a step function, yes, right? It's k Fermi, yes? So which simply tells you that all states with momentum smaller than, than k Fermi, Fermi momentum, are occupied at zero temperature, but the states with larger momentum are not, Fermi C, yes? That's what you read in any book on statistical physics. When people study interesting phenomena, interaction between quasi-particles and so on, this guy changes, yes, delta epsilon of k. This guy changes also delta n over k, yes? And there is a relation between this delta n and delta epsilon, yes? And that's what I was dealing with uh, after reading books on, <laughs> reading Landau on Fermi liquid behavior. That's what it is. So what you are dealing with are those quantities, yes? Distribution function and quasi-particle energy. But then if you do something with the system, some, induce some perturbation or, or interaction, there uh, you will get this guy, deviation of the quasi-particle energy, and this guy, deviation of the distribution function. And there are relations between them and so on. And you know, the thing is that this is why the interaction function of quasi-particles is important. It gives you a relation between delta epsilon and delta n through the integral, that there is an integral equation, yes? And the interaction function of quasi-particles can be much easier calculated than energy or chemical potential of the system. Yes, that's what I would say. What else is not clear here? Uh -huh. Just a minute, please. I will approach you and try to answer your question. Yes? Uh, yeah, what I do, so you have one layer or two layers. If you have one layer, yes, um, the thing is that, look here, um, you have a layer, yes, you have a molecule here and molecule here. In principle, these two molecules, they can collide, yes, and undergo the chemical reaction. But this chemical reaction, they, it occurs at short intermolecular distances. So I just put here R, U over R. And here it's the dipole-dipole repulsion, like this, yes, right? And ultra-cold chemistry happens at short distances, somewhere here, yes? And if the particle energy is small, yes, then they have to tunnel through this 
repulsive potential in order to approach each other at a short interparticle distance where these chemical reactions occur. And the probability of doing this is exponentially small. Therefore, this is the suppression of ultra-cold chemistry. Yes. Just intermolecular repulsion, not more than that. It's very clear, yes. If I have a strongly repulsive potential and wish to see what happens at short interparticle distances, I only have exponentially small probability of doing this. And it's a very, very big exponential factor. Yes. OK. More questions? Uh huh. Yes. How to what? Ah, uh, yes, and people have done that in quasi 1D, quasi 2D geometry. What you do, it, at least they do it experimentally. Um, they obtain, for example, York will tell you if I say something wrong from the experimental point of view, because he's an expert. You have a three-dimensional trap. For, for example, magnetic trap, maybe optical trap. And then what you do, you increase the confinement frequency in this one direction. You get like this, and eventually you get like this. So you strongly confine the motion in one direction. In two other directions, it's weakly confined, yes? And that's what people do experimentally. In order to, st and people have done this first in the year 2000, I guess, or 1999, I don't exactly remember. And they were just confining their systems to 2D and 1D geometries, so 20 years ago, to obtain what happens after they switch off the trap, see the parameters, and so on, yes? I hope that on this level, I said everything correctly, isn't it, Jok? Jok says yes, okay, <laughs> which means that I said everything correctly, yes? Okay, more questions? Do you know if anyone has found that with two layers? No, not yet. But the thing is the proposals to do it, like? Yes, of course. The first proposal was in 2010. Yes, in a later stage, there were several similar proposals, yes. The proposals are present, yes. But I told you that you probably have to wait a little bit because the first proposal was mine together with Luis Santos. And usually when I propose something, the experiment is done after 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. Yes, so, but you know, just without jokes, it's a serious problem because in order to really obtain such a geometry, even with a single layer, yes, you have to really very strongly confine particles in one direction, yes. And for example, David Jin and Jun Ye in their experiment we are confining with a frequency of 30 kilohertz, yes? And this was not sufficient to suppress the, the ultra-cold chemistry. They suppressed it by one or one and a half orders of magnitude, but it was still present. The system was decaying. And uh, of course, ideally, we can think of the confinement with, let's say, 100 kilohertz frequency, but then there is a problem with heating of the system and so on, yes? So this is possible, but it requires a lot of efforts, yes, Ex experimentally, yes? Theoreticians have already done their calculations, yes, and that's what it is, yes? But experimentally, I would say, even now, yes, it's not easy. Excuse me, you have to. You have to have cold molecules? Yes, I have to cool molecules. Is it yeah. not so easy? 
No, it's not easy, but it's they possible. Yeah, yes, it is possible. For example, nowadays, Volgan Ketterle obtained these sodium lithium molecules, the lightest molecules of alkaline atoms, and he somehow cooled them to fairly low temperature. Okay, so it is possible. It's all coming together. Everything has to be merged together. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That's so, time, well, <clears throat> you know, the thing is that the molecules which has been successfully obtained so far, these are uh, rubidium potassium molecules, they are fermions, but they are strongly reactive, mm -hmm. yes? And uh, this rubidium uh, cesium molecules, which Hans Christoph Nagel obtained in Innsbruck, they, they were mostly obtained in a lettuce. Mm -hmm. If you put molecules in a lettuce, yes, and, and they're deeply sitting in their lettuce sites and do not tunnel, then they don't decay. But, but what you can do, they are just sitting in, in, in their lettuce sites, yes? So that's what it is. But now uh, there are experiments of Wolgan Ketterle, yes, with the lightest alkaline atom molecules, uh, sodium, lithium, yes. There are other experiments of Martin Swirline, for example, uh, sodium potassium, yes, and some other experiments. Sodium, the, these are weakly reactive molecules. These are non-reactive molecules. So this ultra cold chemistry, which I was talking about, does not exist in this case. But people are sometimes talking about other underwater stones in these systems and so on, and then, in these two systems, which look promising, they did not yet obtain sufficiently high densities, yes. So I would say that it looks rather transparent, what I was talking about, but experimentally, it's not at all easy. And people are now trying, yes. Yes. More questions? <laughs> We still have time, yes. Otherwise, I will be blamed by our chairs that I do not use one and a half hours and finish earlier, yes. We do not blame. Sorry? We do not blame. <laughs> you do not blame, but do you complain or not? No, okay. But anyway, if there are questions, yes. If some of you, especially those who do experiments uh, have ideas what one can do with the molecules and so on would be interesting, yes? For example, you know, uh, if there are 20 new ideas, yes, from young people, what usually happens is that 15 or even 18 or 19 of these ideas are wrong or, or are naive, but there can be one idea which is promising. And this is, <laughs> and you know, in such a situation, one idea is enough, yes? And if you are afraid to ask questions because you think that you may ask a stupid question, don't hesitate and ask the question. I'm, when I'm giving a course at the University of Amsterdam, yes, I usually say this to the students, because if you don't understand something and do not ask the question, for example, I didn't understand something in the talk of Michel today, and I approached him and asked a naive question, yes? He answered. Now I know what the situation is, yes? And because in a later stage in your everyday life and work, you may meet such a question. And then you will blame yourself that you didn't ask the question to Professor Shlapnikov. Yes, that's what it is. Okay. This is my philosophical conclusion. Yes. So, who is the chairman of this? You are Roman or York? Yes. If there are no questions, please do. Is there a question or not? No. Okay.
thank you.